Hey, this is Tim Pierce. I remember when I met Phil X outside of a Trader Joe's in Sherman Oaks, and I thought, this guy really is pretty cool. <laughs> but he had been doing a bunch of sessions for people that I knew. And so you're always curious when that happens. Like, who is this guy that everybody really likes? Turns out he's very versatile. He has a lot to share with us about being a great guitar player and having a great career. Click the link below for the online masterclass. There's a two-week free trial, so you can check it out and see if it's right for you. I mean, I mean, I was learning cover songs originally pre-YouTube, even pre-Tab. So it trained my ear. You know, like when I started doing sessions in LA, producers are like, because I don't read, I'm not a good reader, but I can make a chart to get to the finish line, right? But they're like, how did you, how did you, um, how you pick up so fast? I go, dude, I learned eruption when I was 13 right. by ear. This is nothing. Right. <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of the same for me. I had no training. I don't read. And uh, I actually had, uh, I'm a little older than you, I think, but I, I had a turntable. It was a bad turntable. And the arm would skip across the record. So I had to build this crane with cardboard. You built the crane. And pennies. <laughs> cardboard and pennies. And it would hold the, 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 the you, arm from scratch. You MacGyvered your turntable. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, that's so that's where it comes from for you. I get that. Yeah, that's a really yeah. valuable skill. If you learn a lot of, I even played in a top forty band. I don't know if you ever did that, but oh, dude, I did. Okay, but my our top forty though, like we played rock clubs, so we went from cuts like a knife from Brian Adams to Ingve Malmsteen. <laughs> so we had the girls dancing and the guitar players going, "What the?" F <laughs> that's even better. That's why you're so versatile. I've heard you play R and B really well, but I'll talk about that a little later. Okay. So another thing I heard you say was that you should memorize all the notes on the fretboard. You should learn the whole fretboard, right? It's like a map. It's like, you know, people know uh, a map of the city. Like, you know, when you get on this highway that it's going to take you somewhere. It's the same thing when you get on a string. It's good to know where you're going. What I talk about is that if you learn a chord everywhere on the fretboard, then you can always land on chord shapes when you're soloing. But that helps me a lot to know the neck too, is just to see all the chord shapes. Well, I mean, and, and you're an amazing soloist. So if you're doing that, then it's a good uh, tip. <laughs> Thanks. I, I, I always take a lick. And for instance, I'll take it, say I'll show somebody an, the A note, right? And you go, da -da 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 -da. you do a lick like that. If you do that, on every A on the fretboard, there's 11 places where you're doing that lick. So if you keep that in mind when you go for a solo, it's like, where can I hit that A? Uh, there's 11 places. Don't get stuck <laughs> on well, two. Uh, yeah, another thing you've said is if you're going to get fast, you need to be able to synchronize your picking hand with your left hand. Yeah, there are way too many people that, to me, sound sloppy because that one hand's doing one thing and the left hand's doing something else and they're not, they're not talking to each other. So when you slow it down, you re can really, okay, this pick is for this note and this upstroke is for this note. And then when you do it nice and slow, um, you, your hands develop a muscle memory for when you speed it up, then it gets really tight. And you'll notice that even it's an orchestra. You know, when you're watching a movie and this person's playing cello and they're going, da, 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 da. I mean, they could do that a zillion times faster, but they practice it that slow. That's good advice. Did you do that when you were younger or do you still do it today? Uh, I do it more today. Wow. Like I just, I just, you know, it's funny because, um, I just put up that video of Highway Star I saw where it. I just where I totally obliterated the keyboard part. <laughs> but I'm not I mean it's a it's a guitar version of it. I went through a week 
where I put the kids to bed and then I call it like quarantine practice, sit on the couch, put a movie on and write and just go do that keyboard line, like that string skipping thing, just practice it nice and slow. And then uh, when I nailed it in the video, I glitched and clammed all over the place after, but my mentality was like, just keep going, dude. You'll never beat that keyboard solo. <laughs> I saw it. I thought it was spot on, but that, that's another story. So a couple of things out of what you just said, you still practice, which is great, because I was going to ask you if you have time to practice or if these days you just play. You just answered me. You still practice. I do when I can. I feel like I'm a worse guitar player since I had kids. Of course. Since I, be since I became a dad... They start taking up all your time and you hardly pick up a guitar. The bigger your life gets, the harder it is to put in those, those hours and those minutes. Exactly. Yeah. But now with the quarantine thing, I, I, I find myself being able to jump on guitar more. I try to challenge myself either with tunings or sometimes I'll play the entire day without using my index finger because my pinky is weak. I'm, I, I don't use my pinky a lot. So if I'm doing, even if I'm doing black dog with this, without this finger, it's hard. Yeah, you know? I, I get comments so on I, my YouTube channel because I forget about my pinky. You know, it works okay, yeah. but it's just so much more fun just to use these three fingers. But so. you don't notice it until somebody else says, man, you didn't use your pinky the whole time. And I'm like, that's right. When I'm challenging myself, you know, like I'll be sitting around, okay, I, I'm in a plateau or I wanted to learn the tapping part of eruption, but not without tapping. So I wanted to, I wanted to take the triad system and pick it, pick every note. But you... I don't have that reach, so I had to do it on the G and the B string. And then this one phrase that my hand, left hand was used to was like, oh, that's easy. And then the next phrase, oh, that's easy too. And then the next phrase was like, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so my left hand gives me the finger. So I just put a movie on and I just worked on that phrase for like the whole movie really slow. And by the end of the movie, I had it down. <laughs> People are like, yeah, I'll never get that good. It's like, well, if, if that's your state of mind, no, you won't. <laughs> now you've talked, uh, I've, a couple of times I've heard you talk about playing through an amp that responds slowly and one that responds fast. The Plexi to me, like I, I can't hit it as hard as I hit a modern amp because it doesn't respond as quickly. So it's, it's almost like if I hit too hard, like you'll even hear the speaker fart a little bit, which is usually an undesired <laughs> effect. <laughs> Right. So if I hit it less with less attack, then it, it that'll avoid that. So I learned that early on. I'm like, oh man, I can't, I can't play this amp like that. Or I'll be in the studio, and this was years ago when I was working on projects with Howard Benson and Mike Plotnikoff, where where uh, I'd be hitting, I'd be doing a solo and hitting kind of hard, and I'm like, and Mike's like, I think you need more gain, and I'm like, before we do that. Let me just have a talk with my hands. Okay, guys, back it off a little bit. <laughs> and then I'd go into the solo with that approach and he'd go, hey, it sounds nice and smooth now. And I'm like, yeah, that's because I'm not hitting it as hard. So, you know, pe people always tend to, I need another pedal or I need more gain or I need this. When all you really got to do is back it off. And then you go, you know, it's it sounds a little bright. So why don't I pick closer to the neck than the bridge? And that fixes that. And there's so many things and dynamics achievable with just your hands, as opposed to the EQ and, a, and an amp or a, another pedal. It's funny because every good, like I'll plug into a, a Fender combo at this jam or a, a, f a faculty jam at a rock camp or something like that and plug straight in without an overdrive pedal and everything like that. And literally crank the amp so it's too loud and turn my volume down to play the rhythm and then crank it for the leads. And then seven guitar players are like, how did you do all that without an overdrive pedal? I'm like, uh -huh. <laughs> it's uh is here. Well, yeah. And you led me straight to one of my other questions, which is, 
you can get all the tones from your volume knob. And I think for you, you get all the clean and dirty tones simply by the way you're playing yeah. and by rolling up and down your volume knob, right? I'm, I'm literally, and I've always been a, uh, a one channel amp guy. Right. So when people are like, how did you get that clean sound? It's like, I just turned down. Yeah. And, and mind you, you need the right volume pot for that. A lot of guys use capacitors and little resistors, and but I, I find if you have a really good audio pot, you don't need that stuff. It's just, especially I'm a P90 guy. Yeah. When I when I turn my P90 down, I want it to spank. I want it to be all sweet and and clear, and that's and it does with the right volume pot, which is a 250 with a P90 it would be a 250k. Oh, thanks, thanks for that. <laughs> When did you discover the virtue of taking out the neck pickup? A number of things happened at, at the same time. Uh, I had an endorsement with ESP and they had given me a couple of Vipers, identical guitars, which is an amazing situation to be in if you're a tinkerer and want to AB shit, right? So, and at the same time, I discovered the Gibson P94, which is a P90 pickup a retrofit for a humbucker guitar. Right, yeah. And I have one now with Arcane called the PX100. I saw which, that. Yeah, which I love and I sell tons of those. And it's it's amazing if you do have a guitar that, oh, I got two Les Pauls, but one, I wish one had P90s. And you don't have to get in there with a router and a chisel <laughs> and you could just stick it in there with a, and just at least try it. No matter what I put in the neck position, because the Viper, I believe, had a 24 frets. With that 24 fret, it put it in a weird position and I hated how it sounded. So reason number one was why I have it in there, pull it out and put like a, a, an action figure or something in there hey. or a computer fan. When I was doing all those Fredded Americana videos, I founded my favorite sounding guitars for juniors. Yes, 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 yes. One P90, no neck pickup. And, and, that's, and that was it. I did some Googling and research and found out that a lot of people believe the same thing. I feel like even if the neck pickup isn't engaged, that magnet is still drawing on the string. So it's kind of breaking up the vibration, that the true vibration from one point to the other. So I thought, well, then why do I need a neck pickup? Now, obviously in a gig like Bon Jovi, I have some guitars that have neck pickups because I need it for, to, to recreate those so sounds. But my, my main guitars are just one pickup. And uh, every time the drills play, we do Fire by Hendrix. But in the middle of solo, I stick in American Woman and I have one pickup and I just roll off the tone control and maybe add another overdrive. And people are like, how did you do that? I'm like, I just rolled the tone off. Do you have a Gibson coming soon with one pickup that's your model? I believe I do. Um, I believe uh, I, I switched to Gibson in January officially and I've been pleased with everything that I've picked up. I, I think the new quality control era for them is incredible. And everything that I've received has just been incredible. You know, when someone says, hey, what do you want? You're, when it's a guitar, you don't just, hey, I just want this in blue. You know right, what I mean? Right. For me, I love the new 1964 Custom Shop SG. I saw that one. I saw your version of that. Yeah. And I put a PX100 in it. I saw that. And it, yeah. it does everything. <laughs> the thing is, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring this up as another one pickup guy. Um, I, I love a fatter neck, but I don't know what it'll do to the balance. Also, I feel like when they shave down the, where the, the neck joint, like in the newer guitars, they've been shaving down the neck joint. And I feel like when you get into the high register, it's not as thick sounding as I'd like. Okay. And then I pick up my 67 SG and I'm like, wait a minute, this thing's got some mass in the heel. Okay. And it sounds great. So that's something I can bring up with the luthier and say, hey, I want the 64 with the fatter neck and a bigger heel. <laughs> I'm making notes. And the other thing is the, is the single pickup. Cause I've had, Cesar is the new guy there and we've had conversations. He goes, I really want to put a little button and a speaker in your signature and you push the button and it says, hey man, it's Phil X out of the little speaker. 
<laughs> and I'm thinking, you gotta be kidding. And he goes, no, man, if I heard that every day, my life would be better. And I'm like, okay. But then I'm thinking, do I actually get, cause you can't throw Batman or Wolverine in the neck cavity because there's a copyright infringement there, right? <laughs> so do I do I get a little Phil X made? I think so, yeah. S little Phil X superhero goes in the cavity <laughs> and you push the, the X on his chest and it says, hey man, it's Phil X. So it's all in one little thing. <laughs> oh, I hope you do that. I just, uh... Maybe we do that. Now, you see, this is the other thing too. Or, But I do love how some guitars look with just one pickup without that cavity, right? But... There's something about the sound there too, with the like. Okay, so Malcolm Young, right? Malcolm Young had that signature Gretsch guitar with just one pickup and one knob, but it doesn't sound as good as the one pickup and those extra cap pickup cavities and all the holes and shit. It doesn't sound as good. So there's something about the wood missing. I mean. Do I get the, them the, hey, so let's make a SIG with just one pickup and then a SIG with a pickup and the extra pickup cavity and let's see which I like better. You know, I think we're gonna be going through some prototypes. Yeah, I look, for, I look forward to finding out which one is better. Me too. Uh, you and I actually got to work together side by side, which was really wonderful. Randy Jackson hired us to yes. do a bunch of records together, a few at least. And yeah. th that's where I got to know how versatile you really are. And the world doesn't exactly know that you can play basic traditional R&B great. And I heard you do this R&B part once and was like, wow, I'm really jealous because <laughs> that's, your pocket was so good. It was just a clean yeah. R&B part, like Steve Cropper style stuff. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. really, really great. Uh, and it was also at that time that you turned me on to the nut sauce for the nut. Do you still use nut sauce in your nuts? Yeah. I mean, it's... Sometimes I forget to order it, and like I'll do, I'll use whatever is around. I've used chapstick, um, Vaseline. So whatever's available, right? What anything that lubes the nut really solves a lot of tuning problems. So when you get on stage with the drills, do you make sure that there's some stuff in your nut? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what about with yeah. Bon Jovi? Does your tech do that for you? My tech does that. He does all he he, he does when he, when he changes strings. It's Mark Van Gool who is incredible. I know Mark. He is incredible. He's kind of a he put, oh, dude. Look what Mark did. I have to show you. Look what Mark did. So I got a, a beautiful gold top from Gibson. Yeah. But this is where I, this is my pick scraping and my up and down rhythm rock playing. It's right where the toggle is. So we we put the toggle here. Oh. And Mark Van, yeah. And yeah. Mark Van Gool did this. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had him work on my guitars once, and I thought he really is the guitar whisperer. You know, he's oh, he really is. he's amazing. He has a different connection and a deeper level to the gear than than I've I've ever seen. You know what? It's funny. Like I'm, that's what I'm missing about being on, you know, being on tour this year. It's going to be miss missing geeking out with Mark every day because he's just fantastic. He sure is. I think I know that you actually. Your heart and soul is the drills and your, your songwriting and your solo career and your band. What was it like on tour right before you had to stop for the uh, the lockdown? Were you having a great time out there? Dude, I don't, I'm, I'm it's so crazy because I'm the singer and uh, the band, we were, you know, you have a couple of gigs with a new drummer and you start reaching this momentum. And I, I, I hate days off. So I was, I did clinics. I, I got there a day early. I did a clinic at the uh, Birmingham Guitar Show. And then we met in London and went up to Nottingham where we did our first gig. And then it was, I think three, three or four in a row. No, three in a row. I booked another clinic in, in Guildford for Anderton's and then four in a row. And I, I, I scream at my clinics. I, I do like, I'll do some Zeppelin to warm up and shit. Wow. And so, and then we got calls. Hey, uh, Guitar Guitar wants us to do a, two clinics on in Glasgow and in Edinburgh the day of the show. And I'm like, well, I can't, I can't do the day of the show. That's crazy. I'm the singer, but let's do Glasgow. And then it's my road manager that goes, just so you know, if you do a clinic in Glasgow, That'll be 13 days in a row for you. 
And he was the voice of reason, Carl. He was my boy. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Let's, let's have a day off in Scotland. <laughs> my whole point is that it was go, 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 go. And then, hey, uh, some European dates are starting to cancel. And then, hey, uh, we should probably go home after Barcelona. And then Barcelona's canceled. And then Holland says, we're not doing anything. And I was like, well, it looks like we're, we're leaving after, after Birmingham. And uh, that's what we did. But it was really disappointing um, in a lot of ways. But we were, we were catching the fire. I don't know if people understand, but I'm sure the travel is not the most luxurious all the time. In Bon Jovi, I'm sure it is. That was the joke. <laughs> that was because I, well, I I'm did, trying I to did, ease into it. I'm yeah, I did interviews it. as well. Because at the same, at the time, uh, the Bon Jovi shows in June and July were still booked. So people are like, so what's it like? I'm like, well, I'm doing the drills in a van, shared hotel rooms. Oh, oh you're kidding. Okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, shared hotel rooms. And Dan, Dan's my boy. We're like brothers. We have a great time. But share, a van, shan, shared hotel rooms, gr some grueling drives. And then uh, in June, it'll be like, I'm back to jets and arenas. <laughs> <laughs> it's not 20,000 people or 82,000 people like, uh, you know, Wembley Stadium last year. It's like, 150, 200 people in a club, but a lot of them know my lyrics and I'm delivering my story and I can do whatever I want. It's, it's, it's just that I just have so much fun and it's stuff that I couldn't do in any other project, you know? Yeah, I know you well enough to know that that's where you're happiest. You could never say no to Bon Jovi and it's great that you're doing that and it's a great gig and those are great people. It's, it's awesome to have both, yes. both canvases yeah. as, as a creator. Yeah. yeah. So this is my thing and this is supporting the support role. You know, John's driving that bus and I'm in I'm in the back seat kind of just adding some color you know that's I feel like that's my job and I have fun doing it and the, and the, the band is great and everybody's awesome it's a great family I wanted to take us back to when one of the sessions that we did together that you got me on which wasn't a Randy Jackson one it was an ACDC ish kind of I remember yeah yeah and and it was like one of those things where like I I felt like our musically and vision wise we were on the exact same page. And I had a, my, my Yamaha at the time, and I had the uh, my PX90 in it, and I was plugged into a Plexi type amp into a 412 cabinet. And uh, I don't know how, I, this is exactly what I remember. You were like, huh, everything's kind of cooking. And I'm like, uh, I, I grab a flat, a, a, like a little Phillips screwdriver. And you're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm gonna change the height of the pickup. And you were like, are you raising it? I'm like, no, I'm gonna lower it. And you're like, oh, <laughs> it, was this, it was like we were having lunch, but we had guitars and we're counting in, we're canning in this track in like 30 seconds. And I'm like <laughs> adjusting. And I just felt like there's not a lot of guys in the room that would go, are you raising it or lowering it? You know what I mean? <laughs> that was one of my favorite sessions. In a, in, that's in the top five, I think, because just because of that, that dynamic that we had together. Yeah, and that's awesome. I, I love that session, too. It's so amazing to be able to if I'm working with somebody and they say we need some we need two guitar players on the floor. It's so great to be able to recommend somebody. And it was great to recommend you for that. One of the things that I always enjoyed is I was your substitute with Howard Benson and Mike Plotnikoff. And it was very rare, but I would show up there when you weren't available and kind of fill in for you. And those guys were so awesome. And it, it really, I really learned how great you are at making records for anybody. You said something wow. in an interview that I say all the time in a different way. You said, as a session musician, you're there to basically transform the song. And then you said, particularly the chorus. And I say that over and over to people. If I meet somebody and I'm working with them for the first time, I really try and make the chorus explode 
Right. And you can do that with guitars. Yes. You can, you know? And so we share that, but you're you're so great at doing all kinds of music, including your own. And and I really learned that from those guys. That that place was guitar heaven. Walking into that place with all those amps, that stack of amps. I have pictures of that. I should I'll post yeah. one of those pictures in this you if I can find it. it. Yeah. It's so amazing. Everybody there is so great to work with. And that's oh, how my. I met Mark. That's how I met Mark. That's he, right. He was, he was there. I the remember studio. now. He was there all the time. It was Yeah. Best people. And Mike Blotnikoff was amazing. We would schedule a session for six hours and sometimes we'd be done in two hours. <laughs> it was so yeah. great. And it was like, see you tomorrow. <laughs> it was so great. Yeah. Anyway, well, it's great to talk to you and I can't wait for you to get back out on the road. It won't be long. It'll be a little while, but it won't be long. It'll be great when you can get out there with the drills and with Bon Jovi again. So thanks yeah, so much. Wait. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me, man. This has been great. It's like it's like having coffee. It is in in the new world. It is, yeah. It's <laughs> but it. no, that here I'm gonna drink my water, and uh, but I I love this kind of uh, this thing because you you have a name, and obviously you're incredibly talented, and you've done so much for guitar and sessions and stuff like that. So being able to just chat, I think it's just more like having coffee as opposed to someone asking somebody some questions for an interview. You know what I mean? Absolutely, that's what, yeah. That's what makes it really special, so thank you. Thank you, man.